So let's start off with a relatively simple topic today and talk about one of the big parts of game design that people either feel really comfortable going into or they may not really know where to start. And so a lot of this is going to have to do with questions, comments, and concerns relating prototyping. I know a lot of people between students to established game designers who have difficulty when they have their idea and they're trying to transition into the prototype stage so that they can share that idea with other people. It works in their head. It works when they try to uh, think about the idea, talk about the idea, but then actually going that next step and establishing that idea, making it a real thing, can be an extremely big challenge. So let's talk about that for a little bit. One of the first things that you need to think about is what is it you are actually trying to create? And in my experience, a prototype actually falls under two different categories that people tend to conflate or confuse with each other. And the first type is an MVP candidate, also known as a minimum viable product, which is a smaller specialist version of what I would then consider a full prototype. A lot of people will refer to both of these as prototype, but it's important to know the differences between these. And an MVP candidate is not meant to represent the entire game. It is a specialized subsection, if you will, that tests out the core mechanic or core conceit of the game. It's the least amount of content that you need to test to see if your idea works. For example, if you are working on a collectible card game like Magic the Gathering or a role-playing game, you don't create the entire game first and then test to see if your ideas work. You create a smaller subset of content and see if the interactions work. So for Dungeons & Dragons, you do not need to create every single spell. You do not need to create every single character class or every single race that's going to be in the game. You just need to represent enough of the content in there that you could build some characters and create some things and have a combat encounter or what have you so that you can see how things work. Same with magic. You don't need to create every single card, every single spell for every single color when a new block of cards comes out. You just need a smaller subset. Like if you're going to introduce a new keyword, then you just need enough examples of that keyword so that you can see if your core underlying mechanic conceit or idea is going to work. So at this point, you often just have bullet points instead of a fully fleshed out rule book. So when we're playing kind of fast and loose with the components and materials, it also means that you don't need to establish a really cohesive or fixed component set at this point either, that's going to be up in the air and you're going to be able to be really nimble as you respond to how playtesting uh, comes back and tells you whether or not you are on the right track with your project. So if an MVP is a small look at a specific part of your larger game idea, prototype is going to be much more full and much more flexed out, uh, fleshed out. So a prototype in general, when I'm talking about that, it's a complete play experience. You can play all the way from your beginning setup stage through a complete full experience. So it's going to have all of the different features. If your game is going to feature 50 event cards, then a full prototype, especially one that's going to be released for exterior blind playtesting, needs to have all of those cards. If it's going to have five character classes, it's got all five of those character classes. The rules are more fleshed out and established. They're probably written down in a more cohesive and edited fashion than the bullet points of an MVP candidate. The component list at this point is probably going to be pretty consistent and pretty stable. And only if you get some feedback over playtesting that you need to change either the distribution of cards or maybe you don't have enough dice or you might need some other supporting components like a scoring track or something like that. But in general, at this point, the component list is more stable, and you're investing more time in it. Now, you still might have some elements that are hand-drawn. You still might have some elements that have stick figures on them. But as the prototyping stage goes on, you will be investing more and more time in refining and completing some of these. Now, regardless, the goal is, if you're starting with an MVP candidate, which is your alpha build, that eventually you do want that to get polished enough and refined enough that you can take everything that you've learned and take everything that you've built in a successful MVP candidate and apply it toward a complete prototype. One of the first things to do though, whether it's an MVP candidate or if you're transitioning and moving on to a full prototype, 
is to take a deep breath and relax. You can do this. You do not need to freak out. Everybody who goes through designing a game tackles one or two of these right off the bat. And it can be a challenge, but there are skills and steps you can follow to make this as easy a transition as possible. One of the things that I think occurs early on in this process is to create and manage a bits list. What is going into your game? What will the players need to play your game? Now, this can consist of a wide range of things. And at this point, these can be things that players scrounge around the house. You might not need to provide a whole bunch of new everything for them to play. So whether they go and scavenge dice from Yahtzee or some pawns and tokens from uh, you know, Monopoly or have a deck of standard 52-card poker deck, a lot of times they'll have paper and pencil so that they can keep track of notes or a score or whatever else it is. But whatever they need, making a list of that and making sure that it is available to them. Anything that they can't scrounge on their own, you're going to need to provide in some fashion in terms of print and play content. Content that you are formatting that they can download, print, and cut out to be able to supplement it. So an event deck, for example, or scoring tokens. These might not be things that they can easily replicate by scavenging other games or using things that they might on have, have on hand like coins or tokens or beads or things like that that they can use for other materials. When you're considering your components, another thing to go along with this is to consider the play area. I think this is something that a lot of people tend to overlook or wait until later in the process to consider, which can sometimes backfire on you. But think about if you were bird's eye view watching the game being played from above, what is it that you see them playing around? What are they all huddled around? What's in the middle between all the different players? It might be a game board. It might be a draw pile and a discard pile for cards. There might be a scoring track, player pieces, dice, whatever it might be. So if we look at Monopoly, we've got the board. We've got a bank of money. We've got a set of deeds set off to the side in front of each player. They've got their own deeds and their own pile of money. We've got some tokens, we've got some dice, we've got all these different things that they need. But we also know that players tend to sit around a table where this content is in the middle. So by having a better sense of where they're playing and how that area is set up, we can get a better sense of what materials we're going to need, as well as what this game is going to look like while it's being played. So think about it. Can you actually see the area that's being played? And if you can't, I'd encourage you to make a quick sketch. And when I mean quick sketch, I mean it does not need to be super detailed. Just something that helps you as the designer stay on track and make sure that all the different elements that you think are going to be in the game are accounted for. So in this case, I just made a really, really quick sketch. This is not my finest work. It's just a quick sketch to show, all right, this game is going to have a deck of cards. There's going to be a marketplace consisting of let's say, six cards right now. I don't indicate if they're face up or face down. That's not what I'm looking for right now. I'm going to have a bank that's going to be comprised of some tokens or coins. Each player is going to have a hand of four cards. I zoom in a little bit to show some of the information that might be on a card. Again, it's just enough for me to take a look at and try to visualize the area that this game might take up, what's in front of people, and provide sort of a checklist of some of the components that you might go through. So, each game visualization is going to be different based on the needs and components in your game. And again, these can be super simple. This is the draft of the game board and game space for my Adventure Game Three Kingdoms. I ended up drawing what would be the map in the middle with markers. The bottom part there that you see with all of the orange and blue spaces, that's actually a separate board that would be the scoring track and tracking different... Uh, events that would occur when people hit different thresholds for scoring. Later on, I realized, oh, I don't have space on here for some of the decks of cards. So I just drew in pencil on their areas to indicate, all right, we need decks of cards on this board in some fashion. So while this is a single sheet of 8.5 by 11 printer paper, it actually represents a game board. It represents a separate scoring track, but it also shows that there are going to be spaces reserved in the play area, if not printed onto the board itself, 
where we are going to need to have decks of cards. So after you visualize either the play space or if your game has a structured uh, specific area like a game board, once you have a visualization of that, really the next thing is to dive in with both feet and proxy things. Start to make up what you can for the components, for the gameplay, so that you can give things a shot. And what's important to know at this point is you are not working with final components. You do not need to worry about how great these things look. You just need them. And again, I can't stress enough how simple these early components can be to be able to play with a game. The first draft of my game, Runaway, literally stick figures on index cards. This was stage two, where I converted my stick figures to Photoshop, which is why you see a lot of straight lines and firmer angles there. But it was still just a template of a stick figure that I then just drew different elements on, whether they were a wizard or a ranger here, but I used the same template for the barbarian, which just has a little beard and an axe, or the rogue, which has a mask on and two daggers. But they're all based on a really, really simple, easy-to-create, easy-to-replicate template so I can churn out these cards later. They can be super, super easy. Scraps of paper, pencils, markers, uh, grab some dice, whatever it might be, start simple. You can always make things more complicated. It's a lot harder to start big and complicated and scale back in my experience. Another thing to consider though, is over the course of this process, things will become more clear when you are on the right track or whether you're going into the weeds. So you constantly refine as you define. And by that, I mean that as you become more comfortable with the bits, with the pieces, with the rules, that's when you start to polish them more. If you start right out of the gate, spending time setting up templates in InDesign or Photoshop, doing full color renderings and art pieces, that might look really nice, but if you're too early in the stage, that might be wasted time if it doesn't make it into the final product. So for Forest Avengers, all of that started out with some quick, ugly sketches on white index cards, but eventually, once I was a little bit happier with the direction that game was going, it was uh, creating characters by taking a woodland creature uh, type of character like a boggart or a sprite or a dryad on the left and matching them up with a particular role or character class on the right. So you could take any two character attributes and slap them together. So here we've got a Boggart Warden, but we could have a Dryad Warden, or we could have a Boggart Druid, or whatever it might be. Those first ones, though, while I was still in, trying to figure out what attributes am I going to have, and how many characteristics will there be, and what sort of information needs to be on these cards. Really crude, really kind of ugly, but they got the job done. Then, when I was happier with where it went, then I decided to worry about creating some art trying to think about spatially exactly where things need to go, what information needs to be on these components, and how to structure it like that. Once you're more comfortable with how some of the key mechanics are starting to work, it's time to draft rules. You really need to be able to move from early versions of the rulebook, which, you know what, it's absolutely fine to just have some notes. Maybe a little bit neater than this, but a lot of times your early notes are going to be on note cards or in a notebook somewhere, or just still kicking around in your head. And that is fine early on in the process. But as soon as you start to share that information with other people, and you are not there to answer all of their questions, often when it comes to external playtesting, you're going to need something more coherent. And the rules are another area where you can refine as you define. So as the game ideas and directions settle in, drafting, revising, and updating your rulebook. It is fine that you've got the ideas kicking around in your head. That's great, but not everyone can read your head. So eventually you're going to need to get those rules down in writing. And the great thing about this is just the fact that you are forcing yourself to sit down and think about these forced to articulate these concepts and ideas, you are going to be able to verify that what you think is accurate, that the turn order really is what you mean, that the game mechanics for drafting or for combat or for resolving quests, that they actually play out the way you want. So I have this kind of Baron Munchausen game called Bragging Rights, which is all about people 
bragging about the different things that they've done, the places that they've gone, the adventures that they've had. It's a pretty simple card game, but I started to go from kicking around in my head to things on note cards to eventually when I went to Protospiel, I put together what turned out to be a three-page rulebook. Now, if you take out these diagrams, which I could have just explained in a Protospiel setting when I'm just showcasing this game to other designers, this probably would have been two pages. But I took the feedback that I had, and I decided, you know what, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to create some diagrams that show the setup area, that show set collection, which is one of the main features of the game, that shows a card anatomy, and that has a robust scoring section at the end. But I also go through and articulated the component list. I articulated setup and gameplay, and I tried to treat this as much as possible as all the information that a player would need if I am not there to walk them through the game. So that between this and downloading the card set, they'd have everything that they need to be able to play the game. So again, started simple, notes in a notebook, eventually a Google Doc that I could go in and update, and then finally I created a more formalized three-page rule book with diagrams once I was confident that the rules were settled down. But it's important to know a prototype is not perfection. In fact, going for perfection can be one of the worst things you can do when trying to create a prototype because it means that you're going to be spending time that you could be better served with playtesting and bouncing ideas off with other people, brainstorming, and other things like that. So I worked on this game under pressure last year in my game design class, and it's about a whole bunch of scientists and other people who are in a research lab in the Marianas Trench, and it's slowly falling in there, being crushed under all the pressure under the sea, and I've got a turn track on there. I decided that I wanted oxygen to become a thing, so at the bottom of it, there's this oxygen track. Originally, it didn't have those spaces on there that were red. There's a big skull in the last space for dying. There are four different areas in the station that people can move around to to perform different actions. You can see that a whole bunch of areas have been scratched out and rewritten, that new content was written on there as I went, that I changed the number of squares in certain areas, that I changed the actions that you could perform in different areas. So this all started just on a piece of cardboard. It all started hand-drawn with marker. And this is still the same board that I use for playtesting this game because my prototype is still being worked on and I'm still getting the kinks out for how some of the interactions are going to be. But I've got this, I've got some handwritten cards, a bunch of beads and some dice, and that's what I use to play test this game that's been in development for about a year now. But it's good enough. And good enough is really all we're looking for with an MVP candidate or a prototype. Can I get the idea across? Can people engage with the concept that I'm trying to create? Here's some other stuff that represents a couple different games I've been working on the left here with trying to come up with some character sheets for a Call of Cthulhu style exploration game. So you've got these characters, the different colored squares indicate maybe types of dice that they would have. I'd say that they'd have a portrait, that they'd have some sort of special ability like library, or being a nerd, or exploring. I don't have all that fleshed out yet on what those even mean, just that I want these sorts of categories in there. On the right-hand side is my first draft of the game, I Didn't Do It, which is a game, uh, Usual Suspects style, about a whole bunch of petty criminals being pulled into the station trying to blame other people for a crime, that it wasn't their fault, that it's not their footprints, it's not an eyewitness that saw them at that location, but it was somebody else. So on these cards, I just wrote down on one side what the play order was, and on the other side, the different types of evidence. And on the bottom, you can see purple, blue, and green categories of evidence cards. All the prototype needs to be is readable and functional. And as long as it serves those purposes, you should be in good place. It's also important to note that the prototype does not need to be the same scale or size as the final product is going to be. The final product for I Didn't Do It ended up being small size cards that are about 75% the size of the cards shown here. And these are big tarot size cards that I have the rules written on. And those ended up going on regular poker size cards. Right? What you just need is you need content down in a way that people can read and people can use 
to be able to play your game and check out your idea. So really, don't worry too much about this. Think about it in small steps. Make sure that at the beginning of it, you take a deep breath. And again, don't freak out about this. You can do this. It just needs some structure and thinking about things in a particular order. So hopefully that's helpful. Again, this isn't going to solve everything for everybody. These are just some steps that you can take to hopefully relieve some of the stress and strain that can occur when people look at developing a prototype. It's a big concept. It's a huge next step in the development of your game and going from idea in your head to something that is cogent, coherent, and playable with other people. So take those steps and be mindful of all the different things that can uh, impact that. Make sure that you have a good feeling of your component list. Make sure that you start drafting rules. Make sure that you're providing everything a player needs to engage with your game concept. And again, you don't have to start out with perfection. You start out with simple. You start out with something you can get in front of the player quickly, and then you refine things as you go. So refine as you define. The more information that you have, the more confident you get in the different aspects of it, the more definition you can put into it. And then hopefully after you've gone through this, you've got a good, well-established prototype that you can share with other people and get meaningful, actionable feedback on what you can do to improve your game. That's it. Bon chance. Best of luck developing your prototype and MVP candidates. Ciao.